my apologies for uh, for being late here. Uh, I did not have the best experience with the, the Deutsche Bahn, unfortunately. Uh, so um, a little bit of the Deutsche Grundlichkeit uh, was uh, was lost on me today. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, longitudinal modeling of time to event and biomarker data. Um, first, my disclosures I work part time at the Binavarit Digital Health. Uh, um, it's a small startup company in Nijmegen. Uh, they don't have anything to do with this, uh, with this uh, particular work. So, I'm a practical guy, so I like to always start with like, the practical reasons to, to do these kinds of things. Uh, like, we're going to see some stuff that's quite complicated, uh, but for me, making it complicated is not uh, the goal in itself. So I like to start with a practical example. And um, this is what really got me into the field of joint modeling in the first place, is that when, we, when you talk to a nephrologist and when they start to think about the treatment plan for the patients, they usually, is what they do is they have a, a visit with their patient, um, they take a whole bunch of, uh, of biomarker data, like serum creatinine, like uh, uh, urine samples, they do medical history, they take other data from, uh, from the EHR, and they think up a treatment plan based on their idea of prognosis then. But that's not, not it. After a couple of months, they see the patient again and do this whole routine over and over. And from that, they implicitly usually generate a prognosis to base a treatment plan. And this makes sense, right? So you, you try some things and you see what happens to the patient. Oh, yeah. 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 No Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, I will. Uh, no, don't, don't worry, nephrologists are pretty good. Uh, um, what we do, however, in, in, and what I've done during my PhD study, I've added to this, to this uh, injury, is what, we take uh, samples, biomarkers, demographic data, whatever. We take it at one point in time for the most part and create a model and try to outperform the nephrologist. However, this does not make sense to the nephrologist, right? The one-time fits all, uh, one-time use model does not make sense to the nephrologist. And also, when we start comparing to nephrologists, and this is what my PhD supervisor, thesis supervisor would love to point out is like, you can ask a nephrologist the subject of global assessment, which is basically asking the nephrologist, would you be surprised if this patient were to die within the next year? And they get it right as about, amount, about as many times as the model would get it right. But that's because they're cheating. Like they've got all this follow-up data, whereas in the model we only use this one-time data. So you could flip this around and say, okay, are they cheating or are we just not leveraging all this longitudinal data enough? And that's what got me interested in trying to use this longitudinal data. A second reason to, that got me interested in this is what, when I started to model this longitudinal data, is I figured out, hey, there are some peculiarities about this. And I'll talk about the, the, the longitudinal data and what makes it so special for uh, uh, in a couple of slides. First, before we go on, I'd like to explain a little bit of the motivating example. So the idea is here to be able to predict end-stage kidney disease, which is basically the time when a person would need dialysis or a kidney transplant, or die in this case, uh, so end-stage kidney disease or worse, within two, years from, uh, within two years from the evolution of biomarkers. Uh, why two years? Two years, it makes sense from a treatment point of view because uh, you don't want to know necessarily in 10 years what will happen. Two years is a nice time window because it gives you options. It gives you options for prevention. It also gives you options to start dialysis or start a preemptive kidney transplant. So from a clinical point of view, the two years makes sense. We're using a fairly straightforward model, which is the sort of like in nephrology, the industry standard right now, where we basically use kidney function called EGFR and the amount of protein in the urine, which is also bad for your kidneys. And then uh, these demographic markers like age and, uh, and gender. So it's a fairly, in terms of biomarkers, not a very complex model, but just as a motivating example. And we've, uh, for this case, I used the Masterplan study cohort. It's a study performed in the Netherlands uh, between 2004 and 2011 in eight centers, included uh, close to 800 uh, patients, uh, all with CKD stage three to five, which is basically saying, okay, so half your kidney function is gone up until you only have 15% left. Um, for all these analyses, the continuous markers, so the proteinuria and EGFR have been normalized and scaled. This is just, you know, to give you a little bit of reference. Uh, this was for the nephrologists in the room, actually. Uh, 
So looking at the muscle plant data, um, very schematically presented. So we can see that proteinuria ranges between zero and uh, almost uh, eight grams. Uh, zero is normal, eight is really a lot. Uh, most people have a little bit of proteinuria, which you tend to see in CKD. Uh, they're mostly uh, somewhat older individuals, which is also normal CKD. Um, their kidney function is somewhere between 15%, and most of them have uh, uh, up to 60, some a little bit over. So the inclusion criteria weren't perfect for this study. And they are followed up on average for uh, six and a half years. Um, slightly more men than women, which is also normal for chronic kidney disease, and about a third at the event. Before going into like the, the data analysis and making things complex, then the first thing you always need to do is plot your data. Um, what you will see more in longitudinal data analysis and also uh, joint modeling is these kinds of trajectory plots, where basically you uh, you make a spaghetti plot, it's actually called a spaghetti plot because it looks like spaghetti, to see what are the curves over time. Um, and already I, you can point out that there's a, a, a sort of ecological fallacy which arises if you, if you just model the, the population average. You see the population average, it doesn't decline a lot. However, if you, instead of predicting time in the study, you predict time until the event, or plot time until the event, then actually right before the event, the average starts to go down. But if you look really closely, then you can see that there are some biomarker trajectories which go up and then go down, which start up here, then go down. And you can, you can also notice, it's a little bit hard to make out, that there are quite some different lines. So some people, or most people, they have the complete follow-up, but there are people who have uh, like follow-up which is much, much shorter, only two years. And they, they offer less information towards this population average than the, the two years that they're in the study. And this is a problem. So the longitudinal data have some, has some complications, like I pointed out. So first off, the biomarkers are measured with error. That's something that we need to take into account for the, the next couple of uh, uh, slides when we start talking about models. These measurements are correlated, right? So you kind of just take all of the, the data points and, and uh, treat them like you would in a linear regression. These measurements are correlated. So a GFR in the same person is likely to be related to the GFR yesterday or the year before. They're taking varying, varying intervals. Um, and most importantly, the value of the biomarker is related to prognosis. So if your GFR is low, you're close to end stage kidney disease. If we were to disregard this fact, then you're introducing what is called informative uh, censoring. There's a dropout due to the, and the dropout is related to the biomarker value being low. And that creates problems. Um, and we're also talking about time to event data. And the peculiar thing about time to event data is that it takes time to observe time, so always your, your predictions are a little bit old. And the event may never happen, which introduces censoring. It's something to account for, and you only die once. And this is about the competing risk. And we'll not cover the competing risks now. Uh, that's a slightly more complex issue. One of the most straightforward options, one of the easiest options to go about analyzing this longitudinal biomarker data is to do a time varying cost regression. Um, and there are two flavors basically to the time varying cost regression. And these, these terms sometimes get a little bit mixed, so I like to be very clear about them. So we have a, a, the first case where you have a cost regression where the proportional hazard assumption is violated. The proportional hazard assumption basically states that if you um, <clears throat> say you were to have two cars driving along the highway, one car with 60 kilometers an hour, um, and the second car with 120 kilometers an hour, the proportional hazard assumption states, so, so this, this the instantaneous potential, so the, the speed of the second car will always be twice as high as the, as the first car. So if the first car were to accelerate, then the acceleration of the second car would have to be twice as high for the proportional hazard assumption to hold. That's basically what it says. This may be violated, so the, the, the ratio of speeds between the two cars may vary, and that's the same for well, the, the rate of mortality. Uh, how can you deal with this? Then you make the, the covariate or the hazard, you make it time varying. And it's this so-called time varying coefficient. There's also a flavor where it's not the coefficient that varies over time, but the biomarker varies over time. And this is what we're talking about here. In order to 
um, be able to do this time varying uh, Cox regression, we first need to tweak our data a little bit. So what I've done here, so I, we have our data, uh, the four markers that I talked about, so sex, the age at fo during follow-up, the GFR, and proteinuria, and we have an in event indicator and the follow-up time until the event. And what I've also added is a interval where for each of the, the steps in the follow-up time, you have also a time when this interval stops and when you get a new biomarker value. And that's basically all you need to do. And then make sure you only set the event indicator for the time, the interval where the patient actually had the event. Uh, so if a patient does not have the event, they're all zeros. That's all you need to do for a uh, time varying Cox regression. So this is actually fairly straightforward and most standard libraries and software packages can easily do this. Um, these are for the nephrologist, uh, the hazard ratios, they probably will not be very meaningful to you if you're not a nephrologist. But what's more important is the figure over here, because the figure over here elucidates some of the assumptions underpinning this time varying Cox. And the first assumption is that the biomarker value doesn't actually change between uh, measurements. That's one of the assumptions. So first we, had a, uh, we have the GFR being uh, close to 48 here, and then all of a sudden if we look at it, it becomes 50, uh, 58. This is not very re realistic, right? It's, it's not like, like Schrodinger's cat, that if it's not there, then it doesn't change. It only changes when we observe it. And the same happens for the hazard. So the hazard always also in this model follows a stepwise function which is not very realistic, honestly. Also, you assume that there's no error uh, in, this, in this biomarker trajectory. So where this step of 10 mils uh, per minute is actually a very big step, um, but it might, it might have been that this, this was a little bit too low due to measurement, measurement error, and this was a little bit too high, and that the reality, the function should be somewhere more in the middle. So these are some of the limitations of the time varying Cox regression. So then a, uh, two Dutch guys came along, Heim Putter and Hans van Houwelingen, they're from Leiden. Um, they started thinking, okay, so what if we just take a huge data set? And um, Heim Putter observed in the literature that there were all sorts of models trying to, to deal with, with violation of the proportional hazards assumption and then make predictions based on those models. And what he noticed is that the, the hazard ratios or the parameters in all these models, they would vary a lot but the predictions would always be fairly close if you start looking at the same data. So what he then postulated is that the, this effect, so the, the non-proportional hazards or the hazard that is related to time, it still operates on the same base hazard, right? And that the, the prediction, which is uh, signified here, the conditional prediction is averaged over the time interval over which you want to make the prediction. So even though these, these extensions all gave very different parameters, they still operate through this base hazard and they still give average predictions. So what if we have a very small effect of the hazard, of the, the hazard ratio changing over time? Or uh, what if the variation is not very big? Then actually this becomes almost approximate to just the hazard ratio. It doesn't matter that much that your proportional hazard is violated. If you're only looking at a small time window, then there's no room for the hazard ratio to wiggle. And also, vice versa, if you take a small time window, the biomarker doesn't change that much. So this extension or, or this, this landmarking that they introduced, so by taking this small time window, it should also work if you have a varying biomarker. And that's the basic idea that uh, Hein Putter and Hans van Houwelingen had. So it doesn't really matter if, if you were violating some of the proportions. Just make the time window very small, take the predictions uh, and, and keep them in a limited time window, and you'll be all right if the event is rare enough and the effect is not uh, that big. So for landmarking, you need to tweak your data also a little bit. And basically what you do is that you uh, select all data up to a given landmark. So here we have uh, several landmarking data sets. Uh, and here's an example for uh, one um, person in the master plan study. And so basically at the landmark zero baseline, you've got all the people in the study. And at landmark one, you only take the people who have survived up until that landmark. 
You do the same for uh, Landmark 2. So this is two years of follow-up. You take the people who survived up until two years of follow-up. And you see that the landmarking data, set, data sets actually become a little bit uh, smaller and smaller. Um, then to analyze this, then basically you, what you do is you, again, do a, um, a time-varying COX with some uh, tricks uh, in the back to account for the fact that you've got uh, multiple observations for this the same person, so you need to account for clustering within the uh, within the uh, uh, within patients. Again, you get uh, a set of predictions. It's very similar to the time varying Cox. However, there's also now a conditional survival effect, basically given by the landmark, saying that okay, if you uh, if you have longer follow up, then your likelihood of going into end stage kidney disease is going to be uh, increasingly large. But still, you see that these that you still assume that the GFR uh, takes jumps and does not vary between the time points, which is not very re realistic. And the hazard also jumps between the time points, although slightly differently. Nevertheless, this works somewhat better than the time varying Cox because you can account for changing biomarker values and do not have to do the, the one time fits all model. Some other authors were still not very pleased with this, uh, this landmarking approach. And uh, um, in the work by uh, Sweeting and Thompson, they reviewed some of the, the approaches uh, towards uh, analyzing uh, longitudinal and, joint, uh, and time to event data. Um, so they, the assumption of no measurement error and the, that it changes, that biomarker only changes when, uh, when observed does not make a, a lot of sense. However, there's a solution. We can have a mixed effect model and that can estimate the biomarker, or at least predict the biomarker uh, value at any time point. And in addition, the linear mix model uh, deals a little bit with measurement error, error as well. So we can attempt to, uh, to reduce the measurement error that way. So basically how it works is that we first, uh, we fit a linear mixed effect model to predict the biomarker values. Um, then we add the predictions to the data. So that's what, what I've done here. So Instead of having the actual observed GFR and the actual observed proteinuria, we now have the, uh, the normalized predicted uh, GFR values and the normalized predicted proteinuria values, which will give you a more smooth function. Um, then, we add, so after adding the prediction of the data, we, similar to the time varying cost model, we generate these, these intervals during which the biomarker can change and also uh, we, uh, we fit uh, the, the time varying cost model. Again, with the function being linear, the, the, the parameter estimates do not vary that much, but now we can, we can at least appreciate that the GFR value has, in blue has been predicted and that you can have a GFR value for any time point, not only the time points where it's actually been observed here in red. And also the hazard uh, um, depicted here can vary uh, as a more smooth function. So now you don't have to wait for your prediction to take place at the annual visit, for instance, that the patient comes to a doctor, but they can, you can have visits in between and don't have to have them uh, per se annually. Still, there's a problem with this approach, with the two-stage approach. Um, first of all, the models are not joined, so, the, so because they, the linear model is fitted with some error, but that error is not propagated into the time-varying Cox regression. So the standard errors that you will get for your parameters in the Cox regression will be too small. Um, some others have therefore um, created the, or, or conceptualized a, uh, a joint models which basically share these features. So you've got the longitudinal biomarker, you've got the time to event model, and they share or they are combined through a latent structure. Um, and this latent structure is the, the trajectory of the biomarker, so to say. Um, Still, it's, uh, this longitudinal biomarker is, uh, is estimated with a linear uh, mixed effects model to, to account for some of the correlation and the measurement error. Um, but the nice thing about this is that we also can solve our problem that the biomarker is related to prognosis. And the interesting thing is that originally these joint models were conceptualized as a way of dealing with missing data, with not, uh, missingness not at random. For instance, 
subjects with uh, steeper GFR slopes are more likely to suffer NSAID kidney disease. And Paul just uh, will, will confirm this. Like this is from their personal experience. They can tell you this. You don't need to actually to do any statistics. Um, also, the, 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 the people who start with a lower GFR are more likely to have uh, NSAID kidney, kidney disease in your observation window. So this, this helps you um, deal with the fact that prognosis is related uh, to the biomarker trajectory. Um, this is captured not within the, the longitudinal model per se, but within the, uh, within the, the random effects of, uh, that you estimate. One of the more common flavors of the joint model is the joint latent class model, which was conceptualized by uh, Cecile Pouslima in uh, Bordeaux. And basically, to account for the latent structure, she uses a latent class model. So you've got a, a uh, linear mixed effects model, you've got your, your flavored uh, time to event model, which is uh, something like Cox regression. And to, um, to deal with the, with, with the structures in the random effects, she uses a logistic model. And basically, this is saying uh, that there are some subgroups in your data which can be identified only by the trajectory of the, uh, of the uh, biomarker. So she did this, for instance, for um, um, the post-radiotherapy effects for uh, prostate cancer, where here on the y-axis you see prostate-specific antigen, which is a marker of, your, uh, of, of um, uh, potential tumor in your prostate. And from the observations, she saw that there were some distinct trajectories for people who had the event and people who did not have a recurrent prostate cancer. So the model assumes that, there, that, the, that the trajectories are, that the trajectories within a population are made up of distinct homogeneous classes. And this is what the predicted evolution of these classes, for instance, looks like. And these classes are also related, related to a survival event. In order to fit this linear class model, you first need to make sure that you, you normalize your uh, biomarker value over time. Um, this is mostly due to some uh, due to uh, to avoid uh, convergence issues, and you add the normalized value to the data. Then, to fit the, the joint latent class model, you first start with one group, and then you start and then you keep adding groups. Um, uh, and uh, sorry, then then you. Um, keep fitting models with an, uh, with an additional number of groups. And you do this until a maximum, uh, minimum value of the BIC is, uh, is reached. What's important to note is that you also, uh, that there's quite a lot of parameters in these models. So the, the number of parameters starts blowing up really fast if you start adding groups. And that's why you need, and that's uh, one, um, to make sure that you converge to a uh, global um, optimum in the maximum likelihood, you need to make sure that you choose random parameter values. Um, unfortunately, the, the packages will allow you to do this. So here you see that the optimum BIC value is actually for a four-class model, um, but based on clinical knowledge and, and group size. So these are like maybe out of uh, 800 pa people, uh, patients, these are only five pa uh, 15 patients in this class. It makes more sense clinically to choose for a three-class model. So this is not an exact science, right? The BIC is a guidance, but it's not perfect. What will this look like? It's, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, basically, we get three distinct classes where in uh, class number three, people ha have an increase in kidney function. You'd expect them to be all right. Uh, in class number one, they have a gradual decline of kidney function. And in class number three, they have a rapid decline of kidney function. And this translates into the survival process where the people with rapidly declined kidney function have a very poor prognosis. Um, and the people with an increasing or uh, slowly decreasing uh, kidney function have a, uh, have a far better prognosis. This is a little bit hard to make out, but what's the nice thing about the joint latent class models is that you can make dynamic predictions. So you can update your prediction based on the uh, biomarker trajectory. So uh, top left, we have only the baseline uh, prediction. And when we start adding data, then the prediction uh, uh, changes over time. The second flavor of uh, joint models um, is the shared parameter or shared random effect uh, joint model, where basically you no longer assume that your uh, popula or that the, the population is made up out of homogeneous subgroups with different uh, biomarker evolutions. 
you're basically saying this is one big group. Uh, and this is more reflective of what we saw in the initial trajectory plot, where there's more of a smear of trajectories rather than a very clear subgroup of people who have the event and show an increasing or decreasing value of the biomarker. Um, so that's the main, most important difference between this uh, shared uh, random effects joint model and the joint latent class model. Again, to, um, to fit this, you first you specify the, the linear mixed effect model, then you specify the Cox model, and you can then specify some uh, ways to deal with the, uh, with the shared random effects. And this gives the shared random effect model uh, a very um, flexible approach. So you can have interaction with time, you can have lagged effects of time, and more importantly, you can also um, you can, uh, um, use the slope of the biomarker trajectory rather than only the values. So say if someone has a, uh, has a steeply declining GFR, you can attribute more value to that than just having uh, a difference between two values. And also what's interesting that you can have uh, cumulative exposures based on the biomarker. So for instance, for blood pressure, this would make sense where uh, having a, a slightly elevated blood pressure for a very long time may be just as bad for you as having a very high blood pressure for a short amount of time. Um, so here actually the longitudinal model is the predicted GFR and the survival model is based on the predicted GFR um, and the baseline GFR and the current value of GFR the, um, uh, is, is, is parameterized and you get this in one go. So you, you fit the two models, the LME model and the Cox model, to, to initialize this model, and it's fitted all in one go. And it's also uh, important to know because it's one of the downsides of the joint model where I'll we'll get to a little later. Again, uh, you can have the very nice dynamic uh, predictions where basically a baseline, it's a fairly uncertain prediction, but as soon as you start adding data, so this is for one year already, then the prediction becomes much, much uh, more um, um, precise. And if we start adding more data, then actually we can see that the prognosis of the patient is quite good, which is good news uh, for the patient and also good in communication. Um, so comparing these models, and this is talking from a predictive point of view only, we can, I've here plotted the uh, um, area under the ROC curve um, for a prediction horizon of two years for different prediction landmarks. So baseline one year, two year, and three years follow up. Um, we can see that the uh, ROC, uh, the area in the ROC curve is quite similar for the joint latent class model and the joint model. And that in particular, in early follow-up, these, these two shared uh, parameter models, these latent structure models, outperform the more conventional approaches. Um, however, all of the models, at least in this, in this data set, they showed uh, considerable over-prediction. Uh, over so the predicted risk uh, shown here on the x-axis uh, was far higher than the observed risk, at least in the high-risk groups. Um, in fact, the interesting thing is that the uh, joint data class model was one of the better, uh, better calibrated models. There are some pros and cons to each approach, and I've listed them here. Um, this is from literature partly, but also from personal experience. I've spent uh, two, almost three years post docing and trying to figure out how to get these models actually working in real life. So this is also a bit of personal experience. Um, so the landmark and the time uh, varying um, um, Cox model, they don't deal with measurement error very, very well, whereas the models that uh, also leverage the linear mixed effects model, they do, they do that well. Um, these ones, they assume a step biomarker evolutions where the, the again, the models that use a linear mixed effect um, model uh, have less of an issue. Uh, only the, the, joint latent, uh, the joint models, they deal with the informative dropout uh, uh, and the, uh, the informative missingness that uh, arises from that. Um, one of the main issues with the joint latent class model is that it uses, it, it can take very, very long uh, to converge. So I've been running this model a couple of times uh, in preparation for, um, um, for, this, for this talk and actually, so last night I, I just, put on my computer, went to bed, because I knew it would take a couple of hours for this, uh, for this to converge. And this was actually a fairly simple model. So if you're talking a lot of biomarkers, a lot of biomarker evolutions, then this can take quite some time to converge. Uh, and I've had, uh, I have need, uh, needed to leverage some cluster computers uh, before and, and got uh, in a little bit of trouble with my uh, boss uh, for, for running over budget uh, because of it. 
Um, likewise, the shared random effects uh, uh, joint model is somewhat less computationally expensive. Uh, however, if you start dealing with a lot of biomarkers, so more than three um, longitudinal processes, um, it actually becomes next to impossible to calculate. And this is because the uh, linear mixed effects model and the Cox model are simultaneously um, um, fitted. So it's the survival process um, conditional on the biomarker values changing. Um, the work of uh, Gerd van Beek and Leuven, he showed that this becomes, you, know, you, you can write it down, you can, you can have a mathematical solution, but you cannot actually approximate this anymore um, in normal uh, time. Um, the nice thing about most of these models is that the hazard ratio is directly interpretable, so it does make sense, uh, except for the joint latent class model where it becomes a little bit more tricky because you also have to uh, account for the different classes. If you're interested in prediction, this is not so much an issue because you want to get the event probabilities at the, at the end of the day. So my recommendations would be to most of the time, if you, if you see clear classes, use the joint latent class model, but you have to visually observe the data and, and really have this idea that there is quite distinct uh, response onto the biomarker. If that's not the case, then the shared random effect joint model will work very well. If you have multiple longitudinal biomarkers, then you're probably better off using the two-stage model or the landmark model. Um, next bit of this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the future perspectives and what I will be doing uh, for the next 18 months or so. So, um, as I mentioned briefly before, if you have a multivariate mixed model, so where there's not just one longitudinal biomarker, like the GFR that I've been discussing mostly, but multiple GFR, uh, multiple biomarkers for, for kidney function, and this is in transplant patients, so there's also donor-specific antigen for the pathologist in the room, and you want to fit your survival uh, conditional on the biomarker trajectories, the computational burden becomes, becomes very big. You're talking hundreds of parameters that need to be fitted quite easily. Um, so my computer catches fire, basically. Instead of going uh, the approach where you fit the biomarker or you fit the survival conditional on the biomarker evolution, um, the people in Leuven, Stefan Fuse and Geert van Bacon, they had the idea of flipping this around. So basically what you do is you take the people who have uh, had graph failure and you start uh, fitting first um, uh, univariate longitudinal biomarker trajectories and then combine these pairwise. After the pairwise combinations, you can average the, the parameter uh, estimates that you get out of this and you can have a, uh, a multivariate uh, um, mixed effects model. Um, you also do this for the sensor patients and to obtain predictions you use a base rule and basically flip back. And the nice thing about this is that you don't have to estimate this huge matrix uh, with, with hundreds of parameters anymore. You're only doing the pair, you're splitting it up you're, um, and doing only the pairwise estimations. And this can even be uh, done in parallel. So instead of setting my computer on fire, I hope to be able to do some other things while uh, running, this, uh, running this model. And this is something that I will be trying uh, to, uh, to expand upon in the next uh, year or so. So uh, coming to uh, an end of this presentation, uh, my take home messages. So um, as I said before, I think that the, the time varying Cox and the landmarking model um, they shouldn't be uh, thrown out with the, uh, the buff water. Uh, they are suitable when the event is rare and the effect of the biomarker is small. And the nice thing is that they're fairly straightforward to fit. So it's a good place to start. Um, the two-stage approach is generally inferior, except when you have multi uh, multiple biomarkers, then this might, o might only be your only solution. Uh, because the, the computational burden of the uh, uh, shared uh, or, or of the joint uh, models becomes just too big. Both the joint latent class model and the joint and the shared ra uh, random effect joint model are co fairly flexible and, and robust, but they are comp uh, computationally expensive. So use the joint latent class model when you see clear uh, from your visual uh, um, data inspection. If you see clear subclasses, if you don't, then use the uh, the method by Dimitris Chrysopoulos. Um, and the correct w one final key piece of advice I, I would like to give you is make sure um, that you fit the, the uh, linear uh, mixed effect, effect models correctly. 
Um, this is something that I've heard from several experts in the field. Um, this is really where the success of this approach, uh, uh, where it's made or broken. If you do not specify the, the model for your biomarker correctly, then the, the survival model doesn't matter that much, actually. So normalize your biomarker values. Uh, you, use nonlinear functions if you have to. Um, and that way you are most likely to have a success and to be able to fit a model that makes sense. Finally, um, for all of the examples that I've had in, the, in this slide, I have the R scripts and, and some of the data uh, available upon request. So if you want to play around and see what I've been doing, uh, then please contact me and uh, I'm willing to share all of this, uh, all of my well, lessons that I've learned the past few years. Um, I finally like to acknowledge the Dutch Kidney Foundation, which have uh, been funding my wild goose chase for, uh, for a couple of years now. I shouldn't be saying this, it's on YouTube. <laughs> Um, and the Radboud Institute for Health Sciences, who uh, funded the PhD, who's also done a lot of work on this. And importantly, some of the, uh, the experts in the field, Karen Lefondre, Louis Ferrer, and the master plan investigators for collecting the data. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and for sticking out uh, for so long, despite uh, me being late. So, that's it. And if uh, you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>